The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Southeast Linux Fest. Uh, just a minute here before uh, Russell starts off. Um, there are surveys. If you haven't filled one out, they're available at the registration desk. Uh, fill out the survey, put it in a cardboard box, stuff it in, across from the registration desk. This magically becomes your raffle ticket for uh, this evening after the keynote speech. There'll be a raffle giving away all kinds of cool prizes. Um, then the whole thing repeats again tomorrow. So there's another survey on Sunday and another raffle uh, after lunchtime on Sunday with uh, more prices. So you can win lots of stuff. So, uh, Russell Bryant from uh, Red Hat is going to talk about OpenStack. So, uh, let's go. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. Um, so my name is Russell Bryant. I'm an engineer at uh, Red Hat. I, I joined Red Hat late last year, and I've been working on the OpenStack project since roughly December um, of 2000 of last year. And so before that, I spent many years working for uh, Digium uh, on the Asterisk project. Uh, and I still contribute some to that, too. So that's my, my open source experience. On, on OpenStack, um, I do a number of things. Primarily, I work on the component called Nova, which I'll talk about more later, explain, uh, explain which, uh, what Nova is. But uh, so I work on Nova a lot. And I'm on the Nova core team, which is the team of people responsible for reviewing all the changes that are submitted to Nova before they go in. Um, I'm also on the vulnerability management team. So I handle um, the responsible disclosure process for any security vulnerabilities that are reported to the OpenStack project. So um, with that, so what I'm going to talk about today, um, so my goal is, you know, is for people that uh, maybe have heard of OpenStack but haven't really spent much time looking at it or working with it, I want to give you a high level idea of what it is. Um, so I want to start there. And then I'm going to dive in because, you know, I'm an engineer and uh, the way I like to learn about things is I want to start using it. So I want to show you if, um, if you're interested in trying out OpenStack, um, I want to show you how to do that, how to get it up and running real, pretty fast and start playing with it. And um, hopefully, I'm going to, so after I go through that process and explain how to set it up, I'm going to do it on my laptop here. Um, uh, and, uh, and as live demos go, you know, I'll, of course it's going to work, right? So uh, let's dive in. So what is OpenStack? Um, I would say that it's a collection of services that provide infrastructure as a service. So someone help me out here and tell me what infrastructure as a service is, because I'm an engineer and not a, a marketing wizard. So uh, I'd like to hear, um, I'm sure someone here can, can give me a really good definition of that. Go for it. I, I would call it a service that provides you with a virtual hardware for virtual infrastructure, which is different than providing you with a virtual operating system or virtual applications. It provides you with virtual machines. Great. So you know, he uh, identified it as a service that provides virtual hardware. It's providing you uh, machines, um, machines on demand, um, and it is that. And um, and 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 it provides some other things too. So so let's dive through and start looking at what 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 specific services OpenStack um, can provide. Well, actually, before we do that, let's talk about the history of the project because it's um it's pretty interesting and it's and it's fairly new still. Uh, it was launched publicly at least, in July 2010 by Rackspace and NASA. Um, and the, the project does six month release cycles and the latest release, um, Essex, which was released in April, had over 200 contributors uh, from 50 companies. So in just a couple of years, it's, it's, it, the community is really exploding. Um, there's a foundation that's been announced, so the governance model, while, while primarily driven by Rackspace up to this point, is, is transitioning to a foundation model. And, uh, a good number of, of large companies have signed up to participate in that foundation effort, uh, including my employer, Red Hat, uh, who's uh, signed on to be a platinum member, but a number of others, which you can see there. Um, so OpenStack uh, is a sort of an umbrella project. Um, it's not, you know, OpenStack is, is, it's not just like one 
piece of code that you get, right? It's, it's, a, it's a collection of projects. Um, so let's go through and talk about what those were. So I mentioned before that Nova is the, the project that I primarily work on in OpenStack. And um, it's the compute service. So if you're familiar with Amazon's uh, services, Nova would be uh, somewhat uh, analogous to Amazon EC2. So it provides you the uh, virtual machines, networking amongst those virtual machines, storage for the virtual machines, that sort of thing. It's the largest um, project within OpenStack. Um, some, of the pro some of the other projects, oh, it's actually a lot of them, sort of come out of Nova. So like we, we sort of, Nova keeps growing and then we identify a piece that says, you know what, that, that would be a good thing that, that can be self-contained. We could split that out and make it a, a new project. Um, it supports, so, so you know, Open, Nova is sort of this, this orchestration management layer. It's not you know, the hypervisor. The hypervisor is, is um, the layer below that and it supports multiple hypervisors. It supports KVM and uh, LXC and Zen, I would say you know, those hypervisors are the ones that are most supported. Supposedly, it supports VMware. Uh, to be honest, I don't know that I've seen anyone actually using it. So um, I wouldn't, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I can trust it or, or vouch for it in any way. And Hyper-V support used to be there, got removed, and is supposedly coming back um, once it got Microsoft's attention when it got removed. So, because it wasn't being maintained and didn't work anymore. So we'll see. Um, there, are, there are a number of other project, open source projects in this space. Um, and uh, some of them, like, like Eucalyptus, Eucalyptus, for example, uh, focuses on the EC2 API. OpenStack has, supports the EC2 API, but has its own API, uh, the, open, you know, the OpenStack API. That um, there's the one that's primarily focused on, but EC2 is supported as well. Um, OK, so that was Nova. Swift is the. Um, so the next piece. So it's, it's analogous to Amazon's S3 service. It is object storage. Uh, there's a native Swift API, but uh, does offer the Amazon API compatibility as well. So it supports the S3 API. Um, Rackspace Cloud Files uh, uses this. Another example user of Swift is uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia's images are served up from, uh, or maybe only the image thumbnails. In any case, some subset of their images, at least, are served up uh, via Swift. Um, next component is Glance. So Glance is an image service. So when you need to start a virtual machine in Nova, you need to have a, well, you need to have an image to start that from. And so Glance is, is a service that's uh, the registry of those images. So you can you, know, you create your images locally using whatever image creation tools you'd like to use, and you upload them to Glance, and then they are available to, for you to use to create um, stuff. Now the images can be stored. It has this concept of storage backends, and there's multiple storage backends. The most common ones to use are just file system storage. So you upload an image, it's just stored on the local file system where Swift, I mean, where Glance is running. And uh, Swift is the um, most common one to use once you start scaling Glance up and you need much more massive storage for images, then it just uses Swift on the back end for storing that and lets Swift deal with the, the scalability. Uh, Keystone. So Keystone is a service that provides common authentication um, for all the services. So before you talk to any of the APIs of any of these services, you, you authenticate with Keystone. Um, that's its purpose in life. And there is a web UI, and that project's code name is Horizon, and it's often referred to as the dashboard. Um, here's a screenshot that somewhat uh, can see most of it, but you know, uh, I'll pull it up later once I get it running on my laptop to show you. But it's pretty web UI. I didn't mention this, but uh, you know, if you're a if you're a developer, I mean, all of OpenStack is written in Python, and so this is a, a Django project, the, the web UI. So um, these five components are the um, major components of OpenStack. Uh, the one up top there, the dashboard, that's the web UI, and then the three the three there in the middle are some the, the core services, the compute stuff managing virtual machines, the image service for managing our virtual machine images, and uh, Swift, the, the object store, the object storage, and then they're all using this common, common identity service for authentication. Um, now when I get to doing the, the, the example setup of this, I'm gonna do everything except for Swift, um, mainly because of time constraints. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through a, a basic installation, and I'm going to do this um, in a fairly manual way, 
uh, because I think this is a, a good way if you're just getting started and you want to learn about it, you know, getting the, install, the package in, installed manually and, and uh, configuring the, the stuff manually is a good way to learn about the pieces and how they fit together. Um, we know when you, when you move to a production environment, first of all, you're probably not going to just run it on like a laptop like I'm doing. Um, and there's, you know, there's good ways to automate it. There's really good puppet modules for deploying OpenStack. Um, people use Chef for it, uh, things like that. But we're going to do it um, as at least a way for uh, what I think is a really good way. If you just, you know what, I've heard about this thing, I'm interested, and now I want to actually get it running and start playing with it. So let's dive in to that. Um, so the first thing that you got to do is install some packages. So, and by the way, I'm using Fedora 17 as the base here. So all, you know, all these commands are, are going to be in, uh, tested on, have, or I'm going to run on Fedora 17. Um, install packages. So um, all these bottom ones, uh, hopefully you can read that okay, are all OpenStack packages. You see Nova, Glance, Keystone, and Dashboard, and then this utils package that has some utilities. Yes? Uh, this is these all of these packages are are in the the core of Fedora. Oh, excuse me. Let me repeat the question. And by the way, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to to ask. Um, you know, don't need to hold them off. So his question was: Are are these are these packages all in Fedora, or do you have to enable some other repository? And all of these packages are in Fedora. So this is um, just on a base Fedora 17 install. Yeah. And the question was: Are these packages also in CentOS or RHEL? These packages are in the um, EPL repository, which is something provided, uh, if you're familiar with that, it stands for Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux. Um, so they are available for use with those platforms by, through the EPL. And it's a, the, the, same, uh, the same packages as the one I'm using here, the same version of OpenStack and so forth is available there. Yes, question? Yeah, will your slides be available some um, I can make them available. Um, I haven't so planned. Sure. Um, there's also um, there's also a really good wiki page that has these instructions, which may be a, it will, will be a much easier format to follow, and I'll have a link to that um, later. But like, if you Google the title of the talk, "Getting Started with OpenStack on Fedora 17," you'll probably find the wiki page. Yes, Robin. <laughs> Robin asks, "What version of OpenStack is this? Is it the new one or the old one?" Um, it's the newest one. It is OpenStack Essex, um, the one that was released in April. Any other questions before we continue? Yes? Uh, it, it's, it's a more general question. Sure. How does, how does uh, OpenStack fit in with the cloud forms? Is that when I hear the, the Sure. Cloud sure. So his question was, how does OpenStack fit with cloud forms? Because when he thinks of Red Hat, he thinks of, of cloud forms. So they're, they're different layers. So, so cloud forms is, is a... It's more of an orchestration layer for, for de doing deployments on different clouds. And OpenStack is a layer below that. It's, it's, it would be uh, infrastructure for actually building a, a cloud deployment. So you would use, you could say have, um, an example would be you could have OpenStack running internally in your organization, and then you could use cloud forms um, to you know, deploy to your open, OpenStack instance or deploy to um, whatever other, all, I mean, it supports a bunch of different um, platforms. It, it, it would allow you to migrate your, your stuff between you know, your local OpenStack cloud and some public cloud and that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Cool. OK, so um, OpenStack packages, a, a group of packages referred to as virtualization. That's going to get uh, all the stuff to, to require to run KVM virtual machines, um, libvirt, that sort of stuff. And then a couple of other uh, services that are going to be utilized, which I'll talk about how they're used later. Well, my SQL server I'm in, it's a database, so it's used as a database. Um, but Cupid is a message queue system. Um, it's, it's an implementation of the AMQP spec, um, the advanced message queuing protocol. So um, OpenStack being a highly scalable distributed system, um, AMQP is used as a, as, a, as a messaging framework between these services. We'll talk about show more about that later, too. OK, so we have packages installed, at least in theory. We do. Um, so we're going to set up some supporting services. Um, start libvir and start Cupid. And start MySQL. And load a kernel module, um, network block device, um, which is used for doing some injection into uh, machines like injecting SSH keys. 
Um, so here's what we have so far. It's not terribly exciting because it doesn't include OpenStack at all. But we have three supporting services running. We have libvirt, which is an, um, a service that provides an API for starting virtual machines, um, a database, and a message system, messaging system. Uh, OK, so now we get to dive into setting up OpenStack components. And Keystone, um, does anyone remember what Keystone is? Identity, okay, excellent. So Keystone is the common identity service for OpenStack. And so since it's used by all these other services, we want to start with it first. Set up Keystone. Okay, first command we're going to run is a, a utility called OpenStack DB, which is in the, um, comes from the OpenStack utils package. It's something we added in, our, in, in Fedora um, just to make setting up the databases for these components easier. Yes, question? You said all these commands are on the wiki page? Yes, they're all on a wiki page, and I'll have a link to the wiki page when I get to the end. Um, yes, so we run this OpenStack DB thing, and it's going to create the, the database for Keystone and initialize the tables. Um, and now, we'll, so we're going to create this file uh, called Keystone RC because, I mean, OpenStack has a web, a web UI, um, I think, but I'm going to do everything, from, well, most things from the command line. And this is just going to set, have, I'm going to have a file sitting on the system that's going to set up um, my environment for running the, the command line tools. The most important things being the, um, these last ones, a username, a very bad password, and the uh, URL for how to talk to Keystone. Um, and I can, so now I'm going to you know, source that file so I have those ver uh, variables in my environment and start setting some um, values in the Keystone config. Um, I'll set one value. So when you first start Keystone, it has no users. So when it has no users, you can't authenticate as a user to create users. So there's sort of this chicken and egg problem. So that's what this admin token thing is about. Um, you put this admin token in the configuration, and the very first you know, time you need to go create that first user, probably an administrator, you use this admin token um, to, to talk to Keystone. The, yes? The, on the environment, yes. That the password, is it hashed, or is it actually just open text, where you, where you have a very bad pass? Oh, a very bad pass? Um, uh, that's, um, I mean, no, it's, 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 it's plain text in the environment. I mean, this, this isn't the only way to do it. Um, this is just like, you know, getting started quickly on my laptop. Um, so you don't have to put a plain text password in your environment. Um, but I do because it's quick and easy uh, for, for testing here. Okay, and we're going to start the Keystone service. Um, okay, so there's another script in, in Fedora that makes um, getting started a bit easier. It's called the uh, OpenStack Keystone sample data script. So this goes through and creates a few users, creates an administrator, creates a demo user, that sort of <coughs> stuff. Um, it would be maybe like 20 commands to do this manually, so we're just going to run this little helper and get some users created so that we can move on to the more fun stuff. So Keystone is started and running, we think. To verify it, uh, I can run this command Keystone user list, and this is the output you should see. And these are the four users that 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 sample data script created. It created a Glance user and a Nova user. Those two are used, so the Glance and Nova services themselves will have a username and password that they use to talk to Keystone. Uh, and then these two others, which would be a demo user, which would be sort of just an example regular user, and an administrator. So here's a picture of what we have set up so far. Um, we have this single Keystone service running, which is using a database on the back end, and then it has a public REST interface that you can use to talk to it. Uh, the command line tools, of course, are just uh, an easy way to talk to that API. And so that's what I'll be using. Next service, Glance. What's Glance? Image, Im oh, image creation. So it's not quite image creation. It's, it's an image registry. So you have to. Image creation is left up to you. There's no OpenStack services that help really help you create your images, but there's lots of tools that available to do that. But it's the, so you've made an image, and now you want to upload it so it's usable um, when you want to go to create a virtual machine. So set up Glance. Um, again, run this OpenStack DB utility. It's going to create the Glance MySQL database and initialize the tables. And now we have to tell Glance to use Keystone. So there's, uh, there's a number of uh, config options here. It, um, you really don't have to look 
you don't have to look at these in painful detail, but the, the high level idea here is we're gonna tell we're gonna tell Glance that yes, we're using Keystone for authentication, and here is your account to um, for talking to Keystone. Because what happens is when you when you make a request, you, well first, so as a user, I authenticate to Keystone and Keystone gives me a token. And that so that's what I hold on to after I've authenticated. And then I go talk to Glance and I say, hey Glance, I want to do this action and here's my token. And Glance has to turn to Keystone and say, is this token valid? And so that's when the Glance, that's when Glance's um, account for Keystone comes in. Does that flow make some sense? Okay. So um, we're start. So Glance has two services. There's a Glance API service and a Glance registry service. And we start them both. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a side note. Uh, you were asking about uh, support on CentOS and RHEL. All these instructions should work on, on that too, except for these, these commands. I mean, it's just service star instead of the, the new systemd version. So I think, I think that's, that should be the only difference in the instructions. Um, okay, so we started the services. Now we want to verify it. So we'll run this command called glance index, and it provides no output. What glance index should show is a list of all the images that have been uploaded but I haven't uploaded any, so it's empty. But if Glance wasn't working, we'd get some error. But no output means it's good. So next, so what do we have set up so far? We've, we've installed and started Keystone. Well, actually, we've installed everything, but what have we configured and started? We configured and started Keystone, and we configured and started Glance. And so like before, we still ha we have Keystone used in the database. We have a Glance API service that's, that's exposing a REST API to the, to the world. And then, in, and then behind that, as a private um, uh, interface, there's this Glance registry service that's responsible for keeping track of image metadata, which is stored in the database. On to Nova. What's Nova? Compute. Yes, Nova is the compute service. So for starting virtual machines. Uh, Nova is, is um, it's the most complicated one. Um, so. The setup starts the same as the others. There's an OpenStack DB utility in Fedora that you can use that creates the Nova database and uh, initializes tables. Um, we had to configure Glance to talk to Keystone, so there's a number of these, these configuration options are about the same thing. Um, except for this last one. This last one's worth mentioning. Uh, there's an option we have to set called fixed range for Nova, which says here's a range of IP addresses that you, get, you can use to assign to virtual machines when you start virtual machines. So that's what that option is. And I did check, and that does not conflict with, the, um, with any network my laptop is using. So that's what I'll use here in a minute and should be fine. So we have to set up an LVM volume group. Um, Nova supports, um, so similar to Amazon's EBS, uh, supports volumes that you can attach to instances. And there's lots of different like backends for supporting that. The default one just expects that there's a LVM volume group called Nova Volume, and, um, and it carves out volumes within that volume group um, to, to expose to instances. So this is certainly not <laughs> what I'm going to, th these commands are certainly for testing only and not for uh, what you should do in any sort of real installation. But it's a cool way to get up and running and for testing. So. This first command, truncate, uh, it's creating a sparse 20 gigabyte file in the file system. Um, so it's not actually going to take up 20 gigs until you actually uh, until you start using it. Um, and then this sort of embedded command here, the LO setup, it's going to create a loopback device on that file and then uh, create a volume group well, called Nova Volumes using that device. So um, it's, a way to, it's a quick way to get up and running um, for, for doing volumes, but you, know, you wouldn't do this in, in production. Okay, so um, yes, so question. Using, uh, real logic volume on hard drive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this question was, you, you, know, you can just use a real logical volume off the hard drive, right? And absolutely you can. Um, so yeah. that, would be, that would be the, yeah, this is sort of the quickie, like, like I've got my laptop set up and I'm using all the hard drive space and I'm, I just want to, on my laptop right now, get it up, installed up and running. And so this is a you know, quick, hacky way to do it. Yes, question? Does it need a dedicated volume group? Or can you just kind of, you know, okay, just add, shrink one of your current LVMs and use your default system LVM group? Does it need, the question was, does it need a dedicated LVM volume group? And it does. It, ex, it expects a, um, a, its own volume group that it can carve stuff out of. Okay, um, so Nova has, 
these um, seven services that I'm going to start. Um, <laughs> so you start them all. Normally, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily run all these on one machine if you're building out a more complex deployment that involved multiple machines. But for my laptop, I'm just, I just start everything. So that's what we're going to do. And um, now that it's all running, let's make sure it actually works. Run one command real quick, Nova list, which should list the running instances. There are none yet, so it's empty. And uh, here's a picture of Nova. So it doesn't, I didn't even bother including uh, Keystone and Glance here because there's sort of only so much room. But I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this, this architecture in a bit, and please feel free to stop me and ask any questions um, of the different components here. But starting on, on the left, you have, you know, there's, there's a REST API that's HTTP. So in this LB would be a load balancer. So perhaps in a much more um, scaled out deployment, you might load balance across multiple instances of, of the API service. Then here, this would be the API service. There's a few different APIs. There's, well, there's an API for managing volumes. There's an API for managing the virtual machines. And of course, there's compatibility with EC2. So there's an EC2 API there. And then everything else is sort of all the internal stuff of Nova, how, it's all, how it works and talks to itself uh, internally. Um, AMQP, so all, these serv all the services use AMQP to talk to each other, um, which uh, is a very, a very highly scalable message uh, system. It says Cupid um, on Fedora. That's, that's the message um, system used by default is Cupid. It also supports RabbitMQ. I think more people are using RabbitMQ because that's what people have been using in OpenStack since the beginning. Cupid support was added in December, January time frame. Does it support active MQ? Uh, I don't think so. So the thing about AMQP, um, it's, called, it's a standard in theory, but there's lots of different versions of the standard. Um, before, well, there's a 1.0, but no one implements it yet. And then all the, pre, all the versions prior to 1.0 aren't compatible with each other. And so the implementations of AMQP, like RabbitMQ or, um, or Cupid, implement different versions. So what you end up having to do is write different code to support each one. So it's sort of the same pro protocol. The concepts are the same, but the code's different and the protocol's different, or at least different enough that you can't use the same code. So I don't think it supports ActiveMQ. Because of that problem, we'd probably have to write some sp specific code for it. Yes, question? Just a practice question. Uh, your key volumes in these two APIs are listing on different ports. Um, are they? The question is, are these different APIs listening on different ports? Mm, no. The, well, the EC2 API is. Right. The others are not. But, but what about things like Lance? The, and, and the real question is, do you front end that with the load balancer to figure out which API is being called and present that as a common interface? OK, so the question was, so expanding from just these APIs to what about Glance and Keystone and the other APIs from other services, are those on different point, ports? And then if you have. To answer that question, yes, they are different ports. And then, wow, you have a lot of APIs that on different ports. How the heck do you deal with that? And um, so Keystone, in addition to providing identity, I don't think I mentioned this before, it has another purpose in life, which is a it's sort of a discovery service. So Keystone also has a registry of all the APIs and how to talk to them. So as a client application, all you have to know is how to talk to Keystone. Because you, you go there, and you can authenticate. And then you can say, OK, well, tell me where all the other APIs are. And then it gives you um, a URL or a set of URL for these, these APIs. So the, in the client. Um, no, it, it just literally gives the client application, like, here's the, you know, here are the, the, the API endpoints. And then, and then the client says, OK, now I know where the Glance API is. And then makes a request there, and then there would be a load balancer or whatever, however you want to get like it. A, a yeah, yeah. So the, the question was, you know, you, you get a response. He was sort of, I guess, getting clarification that you get, you get back sort of a, a data structure that lists the, um, the diff where the, all the APIs are, and that's correct. So you know, all you have to know is how to get to Keystone. You start there, and then it tells you how to get to everything else. So, um, yes, another question. Where do you see the Gluster file system fitting in? Where does the Gluster file system fit in? The great thing about a distributed flexible architecture is there's so many different ways you can use it. Um, no, so, so one, you know, I guess one, you know, one way you could do it is um, 
I guess a couple of things you can do. Um, it, it, could, it would certainly fit, fit in here with Glance and the volume service, um, I think. Well, in any case. So the Glance, you, it stores images on a file system back end. So you could just have that file system back end just be, be Gluster and just dump them all into, uh, into that. Um, that could be your back end store for that. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you can. Car I don't know. I've never set up the volume service with, with Gluster. I'm not sure if you can use it with that. To be honest, I, I don't even. I rarely. I don't think I've really touched the volume code too much. So I don't know very much about it. Um, so, I don't know. I, can't, I guess I don't have really too great of an answer. Okay. So let me let me start talking about some of these other uh, services here. So this middle stuff, you know, Cupid in the database. That's just sort of common infrastructure for everything. And then we'll just sort of go around the circle here. Um, the scheduler, so you, you make a request, I want to start a virtual machine. There's a service called the scheduler, the scheduler that's sort of the business logic about, well, customer X has requested a virtual machine. Um, you know, where am I going to put it? Um, I have a thousand <coughs> compute nodes that can run virtual machines. Using whatever rules you want to use, figure out where to put it. Um, that's sort of the main thing that the scheduler does. Um, it's one of those things that's, um, that lots of people want to customize. So it's one of those, you know, it's, it's a common area where a provider would probably want to write their custom scheduler and, and put it there. Um, but there are some built-in ones. I think the default one is um, pretty basic. It just kind of like distributes things in a round robin fashion, not doing anything too terribly intelligent. But you certainly want to um, get smarter about that. Um, you know, there's some built-in stuff where it can distribute instances to wherever, to whatever compute node has the most RAM, free RAM available, stuff like that. So, yes, another what question. Ship with I mean, what, you said it ships with multiple, what is multiple? Yeah, it ships with multiple, um, and the default has changed a couple times. <laughs> so, um, I think the default is this one called the chance scheduler, which, I mean, as far as you're concerned, it's just kind of random, but in practice, it just sort of distributes them in a round robin fashion amongst your compute nodes. But, you know, I think that's the default. I could pull up. I could pull up the code, but I mean, excuse me. Any interesting algorithms um, that stand out? I, I think the ones that are built in are are, are fairly basic. Um, you know, they let you do things like, well, distribute based on the amount of resources consumed. I mean, that's a fairly common use case. Um, and then, um, yeah, and and there's there's some other ones where you can set custom properties on on compute nodes, I think, and sort of distribute things b based on those properties. I don't know. I've, I've really only used the basic ones. So this is my, I have a use case where um, a branch has requirements to provision their own and their, you know, their own use of compute and other resources. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I'm not, I'm not quite sure I fully understood the question. You know, so you're multi-tenancy, right? Yes. And so, you know, this is a pool of your compute and other resources, and you're just sending VMs, you know, spawning VMs and other resources. Um, you know, I've got a, a grant that is you know, that is you know, someone's trying to run a grant, and the, the legal requirements, the business requirements, is that it needs to carve out a specific pool of hardware resources. Okay. Yeah. So I guess. Okay. So if the question is, um, certain classes of deployments either based on, you know, maybe based on the user or whatever, uh, you want to dedicate hardware to them so they maybe have some guaranteed service and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. That, that you can absolutely do that, and the scheduler will be the place to do it. I mean, you have lots of information about what sort of instances are being requested and all the attributes associated with them, and then who's requesting it, and then, you know, it's only software. Right? You can do anything. It's yeah. Whatever. So um, that's sort of the place where we sort of punt all of that business logic. Um, I don't know that there's like something. I don't know if there's something necessarily built in that's going to solve exactly what you have to, what you need. Or um, probably not. But there's a, an extension point at least where you could do it. Yes. Question. Suspecting that maybe something like. 
HIPAA type of issue, and I think at that point you may have just a, a different availability zone. Okay, so his point was that maybe, you know, with, maybe you're dealing with HIPAA regulations or something similar, and that maybe availability zones uh, would be sufficient, or you just, uh, and, and, and maybe so, so, I don't know. Okay, cool. All right, um, so scheduler, business logic about where stuff goes. Um, over here, uh, you have a compute service. The compute service is, it, it would run on every single machine that is capable of starting virtual machines, and it's, that's its job. It receives a request to start a virtual machine and, and starts it. So it talks to, um, at least like in the case of what I'm gonna set up on my laptop, um, yeah, then it uses libvirt, starts KVM virtual machines, and also um, has to do some networking stuff amongst those virtual machines. And um, yeah, glance, oh, notifications. Um, so there's notifications spit out on the message bus about everything that's going on. So you can write applications that sit outside the system to monitor it and, and, and for things like billing data and that sort of stuff. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's pull back out of the, uh, the weeds here. And um, so what you've sort of set up here, <laughs> it's a cloud. Um, no, no, so you have your application and you have REST APIs. You have a common identity API you can talk to, you have an images API you can talk to to upload images, and then you have a compute API that you can talk to to, to create some, some machines. So that is what um, we've set up. Setting up Horizon, this is the easiest one of all. Horizon is the, uh, the web UI. Um, all you have to do is start HTTPD. Um, if you've installed the, the Horizon package, then all the, all the config necessary is all set up where you just have to start. Start Apache, so cool. All right, so um, at this point, I'm gonna dive into, um, into a terminal and try to actually run all this stuff. And I have a script that's just gonna like, do it all. I'm not gonna have to go through and type it all manually. Um, but also a good time to start asking questions while I do that. Uh, and real quick, in super tiny font, uh, apparently, um, there's a, on the Fedora project wiki, getting started with OpenStack on Fedora 17 <coughs> would be where you can find all of these instructions and more. Um, and then, there, of course, there's, there's good documentation that's not specifically about OpenStack on Fedora. Um, on the OpenStack site, there's a docs.openstack.org and then an API reference site, api.openstack.org. So those are good, good sites to check out. Okay, but not thank you yet. Not done. To a terminal. Whoops. Now, let's make it so you can actually see it. Sort of. Is that readable? I can't read it. I can break my neck. Um, what do we have here? A make demo script. So I'm going to run make demo, which is just going to do all the stuff I just showed you. Um, set up. Um, so do I want it to update the packages? No, I already installed them, just in case internet wasn't working, which of course it's not. So. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Enable Cupid, the message bus. Enable libvirt for starting virtual machines. Load the uh, NBD kernel module. And I think it ran off the screen. Yeah, it did. And I skipped some stuff. All right, so how do I unminimize this when I can't see the top? That's nice. Uh, is there like a minimized keyboard shortcut? Because I can't. I just made the font smaller. So. I should still, if you do it enough, it'll. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, let will just do that. I'll have to keep res. That's going to be annoying. All right, well, we're just going to do this smaller then. Well, I know, but I already did, and I can't unmaximize it because I can't get to the. Yeah. Okay. Um, enable Cupid and enable libvirt and load the NBD kernel module and set up Keystone. And so <coughs> it's going to create the database and then st and start the service. And now I can't see anything. 
But if I keep hitting C for continue, then it's just going to do it all. So um, it just has to go through and, and I mean, it's all the commands I said before. So it's going to uh, create all the databases for each of the services and start them all. So the question was, if you wanted to back up an OpenStack um, server, the uh, what is you know what's what's the data? Um, it sounds and he said it sounds like there's config files. Yes, there's config files. Um, you know, I'd probably have that in like Puppet recipes or something, right? Or Puppet modules or something like that instead of you know. Um, and then yeah, and there's and there's MySQL databases, um, but there is more stuff. I mean, there's you know, the actual uh, images. That, well, you know, if you start a virtual machine, there's like you know, the virtual machine um, image that's on the host itself. Where are we? It is starting Apache. Yes, question. Um, what, excuse me, what was the question? Oh, what, so what other databases can you use? Um, so all of the OpenStack projects use a Python library called SQL Alchemy, which, if you go to their website, supports quite a few, a whole bunch of different databases. It's mostly used with my, I mean, in OpenStack land, MySQL is used the most, it seems. Um, Postgres is supported, I know. And, and those, well, those are the two I see used the most. And in theory, SQL Alchemy abstracts all that away. In practice, not always. So sometimes, since Postgres is not used as much, sometimes Postgres specific bugs crop up. Almost only, actually about, about the only place I really think I've seen those bugs come up is in the um, schema migrations. So the, the database schemas are, are versioned, and then anytime you need to make a change to the schema, you have to write code that migrates the schema from the last version to the new version. And some of that code doesn't always work on every database type. Um, oh, we have an error. That's because I hit C a whole bunch of times to continue um, while it was uh, when I couldn't see it. So I just have a whole bunch of failed to search for file. The back end exited unexpectedly. This is a serious error as the spawn back end did not. I don't know what that is, to be honest. Um, yeah, no more error. It's gone, so it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> okay, so I had some more scripts here. So um, there's one called add image. So before I can start a virtual machine, I have to add an image to start a virtual machine from. So this first line of the script puts the, the, the Keystone RC, stuff in Keystone RC in my environment um, so I can authenticate and so forth. And then there's a command called glance add. And I have a Fedora 16 image. Not a Fedora 17 image, sadly, but this is the image that I don't know, I've been using with testing for months. So, I already had it on machine. So I'm going to add it. There's a few, um, you know, options here. Specify that it, it that it, that it's a public image. So I'm uploading it, and then any user on the system will be able to see it and use it if they want to. Um, a disk format. It's a QCal2 image. Um, container format. Bare. Um, well, I don't. We don't need to get into the nitty gritty details of different image formats, but you have to tell it what, what type of format, what type of image it is, and then the file, and it's going to upload it. And then glance index, that command should tell me the, the list of images that have been added. Um, and it should list this one, because I will have just added it. So add image. And it's super fast, because it's all local. And then this, and this is the output of glance index here at the end, saying that there's a, an image called F16. Uh, JOS, which stands for Just Enough Operating System. I don't know if that's a Red Hat-ism or not, but. Uh, um. So you told it it was bare, but it says it's Qcal2. Uh, that's the disk format, and it's a bare. It doesn't have a container, so it's just a raw. Yeah, two two um, two different uh, uh, things there. So like, it could be OVF, for example, but it's not. It's just a Qcal2 file. Okay, so now I have an image in Glance. So that's cool. I can start an image from it. 
Um, but before I start an image, I, I want to create an SSH key pair. I mean, this is you, know, you have to do the same thing on Amazon if you use AC2. You have, you have a key pair, and then the um, the public key from that key pair gets injected into the image for you, so that you have a way to log into it. So I'm going to tell Nova create you know create a key pair, and then I'm going to save the the private key off to a file. So that's what this Nova key pair add command is for. What is it? Make key pair. Cool. That was done. OK, and now um, boot server. Let's boot a server. Um, so I'm going to do a few commands here. The first one, flavor list. So again, if you're familiar with Amazon, you, know, you can create this a micro image or tiny or whatever you know, they call them. And Nova has the same, the same sort of concept. And they're basically profiles uh, of, of machines. So how much RAM it's going to have, how much disk it's going to have. Uh, how many CPUs you're going to let it have, and that sort of thing. And so I'm going to just go ahead and put that in the output just to show you. And uh, one second. And then um, I spec because I'm going to just to explain with this. So I'm going to say flavor one. I'm choosing the smallest uh, flavor. What was the question? Uh, can it use OpenVZ instead of KVM? The question was, can it use OpenVZ instead of KVM? Um, no. So, okay. Yeah, so, so his point was it can use Linux containers, which is similar, and that's absolutely correct. So, um, the, and it, it uses the libvirt driver for both of those, for both um, Linux containers and KVM. And there's a native Zen driver. It doesn't use, lib, um, OpenStack doesn't use libvirt for Zen. No, no, you don't have to use Zen. No, you, you choose one, you know, you just choose one out of those. So, so if you're working on containers, you still need to Yes. You still have to have, uh, um, yeah, sort of the, you know your template for for what you're what you're booting at. Yes. Can you mix and match like Linux containers and Zen? Question was, can you mix and match um, hypervisor types? Um, you can't have multiple hypervisors in a single file. I don't think so. Well. I I, mean, I can't. Yeah, I don't. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I'm trying. I'm just trying to think about um, the way it works. Well, certainly not on the same physical machine. But I mean, it. It might work. I just don't know if that really should be a supported configuration. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That, I don't know if. I don't think it's supported though. I actually. I mean, to be honest, I don't really don't know off the top of my head. I don't think so. And he said. And, and, okay, so not as the release prior to this one. It wasn't supported. Mm -hmm. Like between different clusters, you know, you know this cluster is KVM. KVM was in. This one is sure. So he was saying he was comparing it to, to CloudStack, where that's a that's capability. And um, so it sounds like I'm not too, I'm not too familiar with CloudStack, but there's a there's a capability at least being worked on for OpenStack called Cells, which sounds like a sort of similar concept where you have sort of this um, this group of servers, all of your compute nodes and a database and and message queue stuff. And um, they're sort of almost independent um, uh, units. Yeah, yeah, sort of federated stuff. So uh, there's some of that coming, but in any case, um, okay. Um, actually, let me go ahead and start this because it actually takes the first time you start uh, an instance, um, it takes a little bit because it has to download the image back at a glance, um, even though it's actually on the same file system. It doesn't know that, so it takes a little bit. Um, so this output that's going to fly by, of course it did. Um, I can scroll back up though. Shows the flavors. So I'm using this first row here, one. Uh, it's called tiny, so 512 megabytes of RAM, one CPU. And then so I did this Nova boot, and that's what all this output is from. It's t telling me all these parameters from the server I started. And then it ran Nova list, and it's saying that the it, you know, there's an instance created and it's in the build state. So it's going to be in that state while it um, has to download the image from Glance, um, create the virtual machine. The virtual machine is going to boot up. And then the virtual machine has to do some sort of like uh, first boot configuration stuff. It actually, it's, um, does anyone heard of Cloud init? I'm sure some people have. Go ahead. So it's Cloud init. It's a really cool um, application that, um, that this image is using. So it talks to a metadata service, which is 
a basic equivalent to this metadata service that EC2 has. And, th and that's where it's going to get the SSH key from. So it's going to talk to it and get the SSH key and install it. And then so once it's all done, you know, per, you know uh, initializing itself, I'll be able to log in. Next nice question. Could you do a kickstart, I mean, like a kickstart on the fly image for this? Um, the question is, could you do a kickstart on the fly image for this? Um, not to, not directly in OpenStack, but you could that you could create an image that way, and then upload the resulting image to Glance, and then, and create a server. That's pretty much how that would work. So Comment. I, I have a question real quick. But, uh, the tool you're looking for is called Boxfinder. Yeah. Boxfinder. Boxfinder that will take. It used to take Kickstarter, but it takes very Kickstarter-like things and builds it. Can you guys have the flavor list or can you run the flavor list? Um, yeah. One second. Okay, so um, so the suggestion was check out Box Grinder for cool image creation. So you should check that out. Um, so Nova List shows that it started, but um, he said, can you do it? Do you know what RXTX factor is? <laughs> RXTX factor. No, I can't tell you what that is. Okay. <laughs> so, no, I don't know. Huh? You said receive, transmit. Yeah, I, I, I will go with receive and transmit. Yep. But, uh, yeah, maybe it's for because throttling network. I honestly don't know. I know from Rackspace, they have the capability to do that. So he was mentioning that Rackspace has that capability, and since Rackspace has been uh, a primary driver of this, it's very likely they would want the same um, sort of functionality for network throttling in OpenStack, and that very well may be um, what that is. I haven't uh, touched it. So, okay. Um, let's see if we can log into the instance. That would be cool. So uh, this sh tells me that the IP address that was assigned to it is that. Um, so I should be able to SSH to it Hold on. using the key that we created. Um, and the user that's, that's set up to be able to log in as is EC2 user. Ta-da. Check that out. We have an instance. That's cool. Now, um, I can also show you the web UI a little bit. Hey, that's the presenter view of my slides. That's not what I wanted to show you. But um, localhost dashboard. Cool, so here's the dashboard. We'll log as the administrator at admin and very bad pass. Um, cool, so we go to instances. We'll see that there's this one instance running and tells you the stuff about it. Um, we could edit some stuff, pull up a VNC console. I don't think I have that set up, though. Um, you could suspend it, reboot it, or, or kill it completely. Um, you know, there's all, this, all the stuff that we went through on the command line, you know, you see here. So I click images, and you see that there's this one image here, uh, the Fedora 16 image that I uploaded, um, which we could delete or, you know, upload a new one or whatever. Excuse me? Can you clone images? Um, can you clone images? Um, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I mean, if you cloned it, it would just be the exact copy of itself. You know, so it wouldn't really do. I don't know what that would be. So what you may be thinking, what what you may be thinking about, and what is useful, and what you can do is you can take snapshots of instances. So what I can do is, so I've created this instance now, and let's say I want to create a new instance. At, so this was just a very bare Fedora image that I started, and so I could go to it and I could install Apache, and then I could take a snapshot of it. And then from that snapshot, launch new instances. So, so, the snap, that, so that snapshot becomes a new image. So you can do that. So that's sort of a, sort of a manual way of creating custom images. So is that, uh, are the snapshots, you know, are the snapshots updated as, basically, do you lose all the data on any image once you shut it down? The question is, do you lose all the data from an instance when you shut it down? Um, by default, you do. Okay, so let me back up. If you take a snapshot of it, then all the data is preserved in the snapshot. And by default, once you terminate an instance, all the storage associated with it is gone. It's, it's the same thing, same case with EC2. But then there's the, um, there's the Nova Volume service, where you create volumes and, and attach it to an instance. Those are persistent. So that's, that's, how, that's where you get your persistent storage from. Um, does that make sense? So you, cre yeah, it's, you create a new storage device and attach it, and then you could destroy that instance and start a new instance and then attach that volume to the new instance. Or you can detach it from one and then attach it to a different one 
So the, the persistent storage is sort of a separate thing. Yes? Mm -hmm. so, the, so the question was, if you wanted to add a second physical machine, do you have to go through this whole mess again? Um, no, not necessarily. Because um, on the second machine, you're probably not going to run, you're not going to run everything. You don't, you don't have to run Keystone on both of them. You don't have, so yeah, so basically, assuming your second machine is for being able to run more virtual machines. Really, you have to, yeah, you install Nova, and there's just a couple of Nova services you start, I think. You run the compute um, service and the network service, I believe. So, so it, it's much smaller. And further, once you start, I mean, if you're doing this for real and starting to scale it out, then do it all manually like I'm doing here. It's probably not the way you want to do it. I mean, there's, there's ways to automate it. So uh, five minutes. Thanks. So how do, you, how do you communicate the existence of the second machine to the first one? Um, it's... Uh, what you do is you well you point them at the same database in the same message queue and that's all you have to do and then they just sort and they sort of discover each other and know that they're there. Yes. Are you running SE Linux in enforcing mode? The question was, am I running SE Linux in enforcing mode? Probably not. No, but I mean we do test it under SE Linux and. Um, it does have the right permissions. I the script set the permissions. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I'm running. Uh, no, it, well, it doesn't set the SE Linux context on that SSH key, and um, and I probably have it disabled. So, I mean, not. I don't know why, but in any case. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, we do. We try to usually run it, you know, in enforcing mode and, and keep all the the SE Linux issues fixed up. So it's it's supposed to work both on, you know, in Fedora and. Um, and the Apple package that's supposed to work. Actually, I think there may be, anyways. You run question. the user interface on the compute server? Um, do you, the question was, do you run the user interface on the compute server? You can run it anywhere. Um, the, the user interface only talks to the REST APIs, the same REST APIs that the command line tools use. So you can literally run it anywhere. As long as it can talk to those REST APIs, you can run it anywhere. Anyone add to the app? Can you run, would you be able to run the, um, UI. Run the UI in a VM. I suppose so, as, as long as the VM has networking access to all the APIs, which it probably would, because the APIs are intended to be public interfaces. I mean, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but as, as long as you, know, you can run it anywhere, including in a VM, as long as it has access to the to the REST APIs. Um, cool. <coughs> Another question. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to imagine how do you get to the console on one of the running instances. How do you get to the console on one of the running instances? Um, well, in this case, I don't really need to because what because the way it got initialized with an SSH key, so I can just SSH into it. Um, if you need to get to the console, then it uh, supports um, exposing it via VNC. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's a I don't remember the name off the top of my head. So there's a there's an API call. Not no help. Um, Oh, I'm in the VM, so it doesn't have Nova installed. OK. Nova, oh, I think it's Git VNC console or something like that. And um, anyways. It is exposed from the web UI. I don't think I have it set up. Because um, uh, it uses, so actually, it's kind of interesting the way it works. So it, it's, it's VNC inside of, um, you know, within Nova. But then it's, it, it's tunneled over HTTP and web sockets. And then it, um, so the web UI actually uses this, um, two minutes, all right, we'll wrap it up here soon. Um, it uses a, uh, an app called NoVNC, which is this uh, fancy HTML5 VNC client. So, um, and so that's what it pulls up. Although I don't, we don't have NoVNC package in Fedora yet, although someone's working on it, so that's why it's not gonna work, because um, I didn't install it manually. Yeah. So what are the downsides to running like DevStack to run like, say I have a, Yeah. Uh, we do it. Is, is there a way to do that? And or what are the new things in, in master that aren't in SX? Um, okay, so a few questions packed into there. 
which I don't know if I can answer in 30 seconds. Um, well, let me list, maybe we can talk, because I, I, I think I have to wrap it up. But he, he mentioned DevStack and um, you know, what, what would be good or bad about using DevStack. So let me, let me at least just mention what DevStack is, and that may be about all I have time for. But DevStack is, um, I use it quite often. I probably use that more than I use this sort of method. Uh, what's, what's cool about DevStack is that, well, it's good for development purposes. When I'm hacking on the code, it's running all the OpenStack stuff straight out of Git checkouts which is cool for a developer, but not necessarily good for a repeatable production deployment. Um, so that's what's bad about it. It's great for really quick. Um, it's, it's one script you run that starts all the stuff up, but um, it doesn't use, it's not using packages for OpenStack. It's just using the latest stuff out of Git. Uh, what's the newest stuff in, um, um, yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's talk afterwards. Probably, probably don't have time to, to run through all that. But um, OK, um, maybe like one. Super quick one. Does it support IPv6? Does it support IPv6? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, cool. Well, I think um, that's about all the time I had. Uh, let me have, if you'd like to talk more, feel free to contact me. It's my email address, um, and I'm on Twitter. Feel free to, to, to get me there, too. Um, and thank you very much for your time and your, and your t attention. I, I appreciate it very much. <laughs> When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. 
community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is gonna fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.